Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar entitled Shifting to Flexible Learning and the Implementation Challenges to BARM HEIs. This is broadcasted live via Hekbal Facebook page and YouTube channel. This activity is also made possible in partnership with the Ministry of Basic, Higher, and Technical Education in Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. Joining us this afternoon are two renowned speakers who are adept practitioners of flexible learning from the University of the Philippines. I am Eden Stephanie Bolido, your moderator for today. Let us formally begin this program with an opening remarks. She is appointed as Executive Director 4 of the Commission on Higher Education last February 12, 2020. Concurrent to this appointment, she is also designated as the officer in charge, Office of the Executive Director of the Unified Financial Assistance System for Tertiary Education, or the UNIFAST, Secretariat on February 4, 2020 up to present. Aside from her concurrent designations, she has represented the Commission in the Cabinet Assistance System, Dangerous Drugs Board, National Chemical, Biological, and Nuclear Team, Presidential Anti-Corruption Commission, among others. Within the CHED, she also chairs numerous technical working groups that were created and convened to work on planning the implementation of policy directions given by the Commission and Bank and the Philippine government as a whole. As CHED OIC Executive Director, she was the Philippine representative to the University Napoli in Italy and to the Intergovernmental Meeting of Experts on the Global Convention on the Recognition of Higher Education Qualifications in Austria. As the Executive Director, she serves as the head of the Commission Secretariat and oversees the overall implementation and operations of the Chad Central and Regional Offices. Ladies and gentlemen, Please help me welcome Attorney Cinderella Filipina S. Benitez Haro. Hi, Eden. And then to our, to our officials from the Bangsamoro Ministry of Basic Higher and Technical Education, our invited resource persons, uh, Dr. Aimeline Barion Dapo and Dr. Merlin Paon Lagi, fellow Commission on Higher Education officials, Dr. Nelia Alibin, BARM Higher Education Institutions Presidents or Heads, HECBOL staff, our organizers, participants, to everyone present here today, a pleasant day to you all. We are gathered here today for our second webinar series under the higher education in the context of the Bangsamoro Organic Law Project on Flexible Learning. As we all know, the emergence of COVID-19 pandemic brought unprecedented disruptions in the lives of many Filipinos or many Filipinos. It came so unexpectedly where no one was ready enough to brace its impact for our society. The Philippines faced a critical situation due to the rise of said health crisis. For higher education institutions, avoiding and limiting the risks of infection of the academic community has been the primary concern. Hence, with the implementation of community quarantine, conduct of classes to, um, need, was, uh, needed to be immediately suspended. The challenge then was how to continue teaching and learning beyond the usual face-to-face -face instruction. Thus, it has become an urgent need to explore innovative learning modalities that will facilitate migration from traditional to flexible teaching and learning options. Flexible learning is defined by the Commission as the design and delivery of programs, courses, and interventions that address learners' unique needs in terms of pace, place, process, and products of learning. While it focuses on essential experiences, content, and outcomes, it also promotes learner control and customizability, thus making it different from other instructional designs. As learners are differently situated in terms of time, pace, and place, these options allow customization of delivery modes, responsive to students' need for access to quality education. This shall also give students the option to choose the delivery mode most convenient to them as early as the time of their enrollment. 
The paradigm shift, therefore, in the teaching and learning process in Philippine higher education institutions or higher education necessitates collaboration among our stakeholders and strengthening the culture of sharing of knowledge and best practices. Everyone is called to be part of this transition or our transformation towards new normal. To achieve this, humanity needs leadership and solidarity to defeat the coronavirus. So for today, as part of the Ched Hetball's project's capability building activities for higher education institutions in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, we hope that through our webinar, we might all be enlightened on the implications relative to the shift of uh, our higher education institutions to flexible learning strategies for academic year 2020-2021 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic possible implementation challenges and suggested interventions to overcome will also be discussed by our invited speakers. Our resource persons are Dr. Aimi Dupo and Dr. Marlene Paonlagi, who are both from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Thank you very much and once again, good morning to everyone. Thank you so much, Attorney Cindy, for that very informative and interesting opening remarks. For those who attended the first webinar, the words redesign, realign, and restructure have been discussed. And now is the proper time to deepen our knowledge on the technical know-how on this paradigm shift of curricular requirements. Ladies and gentlemen, to formally introduce our credible speaker. I would like to call in Ms. Marion Feli Fernandez, Project Technical Staff of the Higher Education in the context of Bangsamaro Organic Law or the HECBOL Project. Thank you, Ma'am Eden. Good afternoon, everyone. Our first speaker is currently Professor Fenn at the Institute of Biological Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, University of the Philippines, Los Banos and the secretary of the UPLB Graduate School. She is also the UPLB Museum of Natural History's curator for moths and spiders. She obtained her PhD in entomology in 2011 from UPLB. She has communicated the results of her research through 43 refereed publications and two book chapters. In addition, she has described more than 52 species of spiders and 22 species of rice black bugs. Her passion for science and teaching about biodiversity earned her the NAST Outstanding Young Scientist in 2015 and the Batu Balani Many Faces of a Teacher Award in 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Dr. Aimee Lynn B. Dupo. Hello, good afternoon, ma'am. And Hello, thank you so much. Yes, magandang hapon. It's an honor to be with everyone this afternoon. Okay, good afternoon. So we will be discussing something on flexible learning, specifically entitled Ban New High to Flexible Learning in Higher Education. So let me begin first with a discussion on how higher education in the Philippines is not a stranger to disruptions. Search engines, for instance, have changed the way we value the task of memorizing facts or chunks of information. Nowadays, if you want to know about something, you would just Google it. Even in the manner by which we execute the learning process has changed. Many higher education institutions have shifted learning approaches from teacher-centered to learner-centered approaches. Undoubtedly, today is not the day to discuss outcomes. I'm sure we had mulled over those for quite some time when we revised our degree programs. Let us not relieve that moment again. This afternoon, we are on a virtual meet because of another disruption, one so powerful that it is enough to change the way we instruct, the way we teach, but also the way we live. The COVID-19 pandemic has paved the way for a paradigm shift 
in the way we deliver our learning experiences to our students. Such a change in the teaching learning process is what I would like to describe as Banyuhay. Banyuhay is a Visayan term for the biological phenomenon which we know as metamorphosis. Because of our background in basic biology, we can easily recount how a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. And another example, let us look at how a bee becomes a bee by watching this short clip. So here is a bee egg as it hatches into a larva. Okay. Those newly hatched larva will now be growing and turning into pupa. The head and the legs will transform and they will become pupa. It's the same pupation process seen above. The ones you see running around are mites. And notice how the head is starting to form. Literally, the head is reorganizing as the eyes are being formed. So now you have an adult bee. Okay, so everything seems so simple, right? If you look at the process, it's just from the egg right to the adults. But in actuality, it is a painful process wherein the immature insect literally melts itself into a new mold, which is the adult form. Many do not even survive the process. Let me show you what complex hormonal processes are involved in here. The whole process of development of an insect is influenced mainly by three hormones. One would be the prothoracicotropic hormone known as the PTTH, ecdysone, and the juvenile hormone, which are secreted by the neurosecretory cells of the brain, the prothoracic gland, and the corpora alata, respectively. The active form of ecdysone triggers a series of physiological events leading to for the formation of a new exoskeleton, which we know as the apolysis. Meanwhile, it is the juvenile hormone that maintains the insect in young state, and it modifies expression of malt. It acts in conjunction with ecdysone. This hormone favors the synthesis of larval structures and adult differentiation. This webinar for this, let me tell you that you are in the right place. We are here to talk about the new high to flexible learning in higher education. Consider the caterpillar or even uh, the larva of the bee to represent your institution's existing gridlock procedures. Banyuhay is all about transformation to achieve institutional excellence and growth through dynamic adaptation, through uh, adaptation to disruptions. However, the transition to flexible learning is not without a hitch. It is an interplay of many factors, and if done right, it can lead to something beautiful. Next, if you look at the new high to flexible learning, the framework for implementing flexible learning can be depicted as follows. So your program outcomes have a double-edged harrow or a double-headed relationship with how you design and deliver your courses and even with how you assess your course design and delivery. It also involves a good support from faculty, staff, and students. Important factors that are promoters in the transition or adoption of flexible learning broadly include the following. You have the faculty, the learners, the course design and delivery, as well as support. If you look at the heading underneath flexible learning, you will find the modular approach, blended and remote learning. So there are different mechanisms by which you can implement flexible learning. So my talk will be focusing on the following faculty, namely different folks, different strokes. Our learners is poor generational intelligence a setback. Course design and delivery, promoting inclusive and equitable education. And lastly, support. Let us ask ourselves, are we change ready? 
With faculty, I place the faculty in the first item for discussion because in the course of our dealing with this pandemic, we forgot about faculty as prime movers in eliciting banyuhay in flexible learning. We have to take note the readiness of faculty for flexible learning. We have to look at age of faculty as they influence how they prepare and adapt to disruptions. Thereby, profiling is a very important task. We, the faculty, were so busy attending to the intellectual, emotional, and sometimes even the financial needs of our students that we forgot to ask ourselves, how are the faculty faring in all of this? The next slide shows you different generations are working closely in designing a flexible learning environment. One needs to consider that our faculty is dealing with the same disruption this 2020, that is, the COVID-19 pandemic. But you also need to consider that they have dealt with other disruptions in the past too. Each helps shape who they are now as an educator. Remember the transition from telephones to smartphones? How about snail mail to email and now chat? of acetate transparencies and PowerPoint presentations and lectures, each disruption has changed the face of classroom setup. Hence, the characteristic of the educator determines the readiness for flexible learning, including how they use information and communication technology. Different generations experience different sets of disruptions. This leads to intergenerational differences which can be considered a boon and a bane in the adoption of flexible learning. It is a boon when members of the faculty come together to provide professional support to one another in developing meaningful learning materials for our learners. Traditionalists and baby boomers may very well be inspirational sources of valuable learning content. Faculty from younger generations can benefit from the wisdom of experience. On the other hand, more senior faculty can solicit help from junior faculty in converting lessons online. Meanwhile, intergenerational differences can become a bane when these differences become mechanisms for exclusion. When senior faculty refuse and resist to be more open to remote aspect part of flexible learning, it becomes a problem for the learner. Overuse of information and communication technology by young faculty without good facilitation and mentorship, while seemingly efficient, can become ineffective and shortchanges our learners too. Now let's look at the learners. Generational conflict happens when older and younger participants in the learning process misinterpret each other's behavior. It is therefore crucial to understand why learners from another generation behave the way they do. Recognizing these differences promote harmony in the learning process. Let me just demonstrate some examples. Let us start with the motivation of two extreme generations, the baby boomers, those who were born between the years of 1940 and 1960, and generations Y to Z around 1996 onwards. Baby boomers would prefer direct consultations, valuing experience of a senior mentor to guide the learner. However, motivation for the younger uh, generation lies with reverse mentorship, wherein parties have expressed agreement to learn from one another. And this definitely influences how we intend to design the delivery of our learning resources to keep students engaged. Our learners also have different preference on when to receive feedback. Traditional learning schemes, often cite schedules for consultation, but in the flexible learning mode, we must consider that our present day learners want instantaneous feedback. So how might we do this? We must be accommodating in terms of schedules and deadlines. Simply put, we must keep communication lines open. Communication meanwhile, will now shift from face to face to higher use of information, communication, and technology. Many of our learners make use of a multitude of communication sources like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, using handheld devices. So flexible 
the flexible learning scheme can take stock on this. Lastly, we must be aware that our learners do not necessarily go online to learn. Remember that learners nowadays use ICT for social engagement too. So what now in terms of course design and delivery? Are we starting from zero? Let's do the math. Let's look at outcomes, courses, and delivery. In terms of curriculum design and delivery, we are not starting from scratch here. Adopting flexible learning schemes still employs the same review of program learning outcomes, but we now use this to redesign how the course may be effectively delivered. For instance, courses in the natural sciences that need to address the accomplishment of skills-based outcomes may consider to implement blended learning as it derives the best parts of face-to-face -face and information and communication technology learning modalities. However, the course must be designed to consider when to employ the delivery of practical assessment for these outcomes. Uh, for example, deferring practical or field activities later in the semester when it's uh, more or less safer to go out. The flexible learning scheme takes into consideration inclusive and equitable education by highlighting a synchronous approach to learning. Our learners are not enclosed in a controlled and enclosed environment like a classroom. So we have no control over when, how they would like to learn. Now, in terms of support, one key question that we should be asking is that, are we change ready? So again, we go back to our four factors. Faculty as the agents of change, students as the products of change, courses as the tools for change, and support as change culture facilitators. Higher education institutions seeking to thrive under the current disruption have to adopt in a change adept culture with the mindset that no one gets left behind. And what does this entail? Support for the transition to flexible learning scheme means providing assistance for assessing problems and identifying opportunities for improvement for both faculty and staff. Managing implementation of, implementation of flexible learning schemes to consider generational and cultural diversity in faculty, student, and staff who engage in collaborative engagement activities is very much needed. Again, we ultimately go back to why we are doing this. There is a disruption, and this is changing the way we are delivering instructions for learning. We are counting on faculty to be the juvenile hormones of this Banyuhay, our agents of change, in moving to a change-ready culture, which employs flexible learning. And on a final note, let us, uh, I would like to share with you a lesson from a caterpillar. So this is a lesson from Yellow. This is from the book, Hope for the Flowers by Trina Polis. Yellow decided to risk for a butterfly. For courage, she hung right beside the other cocoon and began to spin her own. Imagine, I didn't even know I could do this. That's some encouragement that I'm on the right track. If I have the stuff inside me to make cocoons, maybe the stuff inside me for butterflies is there too. So with that, I thank everyone for listening this afternoon. If we have any questions, feel free to raise it uh, in a few minutes. All right, there you have it. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Amy Dupo for that very scientific and informative presentation on flexible learning. I know our audience are very receptive with ideas you shared. Yes, and I'd like to quote you, ma'am. So I got two best ideas. So you said about paradigm shift in the way we deliver these experiences to our students. And another one is the concept, very good concept on Banyuhay, which is what we call the metamorphosis. Since all of what we're doing now are about transformation to achieve excellence and growth through dynamic adaptations amid this disruption, the COVID-19. All right, we'll get back to you later, ma'am. Okay. 
to, intru to introduce another perspective on the implementation process, please help me welcome uh, Ms. Marian to introduce our second resource speaker. Our second resource speaker possesses more than 30 years of professional experience in conducting baseline studies, social and impact assessment studies using both qualitative and quantitative methods of research. She holds a PhD in demography from Australian National University, MS in Rural Sociology from University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Out of 30 years of professional experience, 20 years were devoted in conducting research in various fields, such as early education, health and nutrition of children, rural development, and gender and development. Her research outputs were published as journal articles, chapters in a book, policy briefs, and conference proceedings. She is currently connected with the College of Public Affairs and Development at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, as university researcher and also associate professor five. Our second resource speaker possesses more than 30 years of professional experience in conducting baseline studies, social and impact assessment studies, using both qualitative and quantitative methods of research. She holds a PhD in demography from Australian National University, MS in Rural Sociology from University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Out of 30 years of professional experience, 20 years were devoted in conducting research in various fields, such as early education, health and nutrition of children, rural development, and gender and development. Her research outputs were published as journal articles, chapters in a book, policy briefs, and conference proceedings. She is currently connected with the College of Public Affairs and Development at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, as university researcher and also associate professor five for 30 years. She develops proposals and implements research and extension programs and projects at the university. She teaches social policy, data analysis, both in quantitative and qualitative methods and modeling for public affairs. She is now the director of the Center for Strategic Planning and Policy Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Merlin Paunlagi. Hello, Dr. Paunlagi. Yeah. Thank Hello, you very afternoon. much again, ma'am. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. So, All right, so can start. You may start. Thank you yes, for the, very, the generous introduction, double introduction, in fact. So it gave me more time to think about my presentation. So thank you very much. Again, good afternoon. For my presentation for this afternoon, this is based on the study that we did in the five provinces of the uh, Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, including the island provinces of Basilan, Sulu, Tawi-Tawi, and uh, Lanao del Sur and Maguindanao. Um, as an introduction to this one, RAC ADM project was funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of the Australian government based here in the Philippines. As a background to this, I would like to say that um, Dr. Amy was right that there, are, there were interruptions in the past that we need to innovate. Our problem with access to and quality of education has been there for quite a while. And this is more serious in other parts of the country than in others. For example, in the, in the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao, the percentage of students who have, been, who have not been attending school was estimated to be up about one fifth. And this has remained unchanged from 2002 and to 2010. Specifically, 87% of five-year-old school children were not in school in 2008. So it is 
uh, continuous problem that we have been experiencing that needs to be responded. So for my presentation for this afternoon, I'll be introducing you to the ADM or the Alternative Delivery Model of Education. And after its implementation, my presentation will focus on did it achieve its main goal? And also, what were the challenges met in the implementation of the program? And lastly, I will relate to you how does the experience in the implementation of the alternative model of education relate to flexible learning? What were the nuggets of gold, the experience that we gained from the implementation of the BRAC ADM and how we can use this into moving on to flexible learning in higher education. So I just like to inform everyone that the BRAC, pro that the BRAC program was um, implemented by an international NGO based in Bangladesh. The Australian government trusted them to be able to implement program this alternative delivery model of education that will increase access to and improve the quality of education in the barn. Just to reiterate, the program goal was to improve access to and the quality of education, thereby contributing to the overall improvement of basic education in ARM. And the program has really provided an opportunity for these out of school children to access education. So I'm putting here, what are the similarities and the differences between the BRAC and the DepEd? Well, they follow the same curriculum, the same student assessment, but are differences, which was mainly due to the foreign fund, funds provided by the uh, Australian government. They, have, they provided free books and all the reading materials, organizational structure, their method of delivery is quite different and they have a different monitoring and evaluation. So what is BRAC ADM? At the beginning, it was, um, there was a misconception that BRAC competes with the existing educational system. It was not. It was really complementing what is already existing because most of the schools that they have established were located in the most remote part of the, these five provinces. And how they were able to do it? Well, they did the community profiling, really going into these communities and finding out, are there existing facilities that can be used as learning centers? Are there enough number of children who can attend school? And so, they were able to do this because of the extensive data collection and immersion in the different provinces. And so what are the main strategies of this ADM project? They have curriculum development, the learning centers or the schools, what capacity building they had in the implementation. And lastly, I'll focus on Project, a bit of mon uh, project manage, uh, management, but more on monitoring and evaluation. And I'll discuss them to you one by one in the next slide. Well, for curriculum development, long before the project was implemented, a unit was really created to look at the um, curriculum because it was at the time that the K-12 was recently, uh, was newly implemented and so, they had to follow the K-12 curriculum, but with the local flavor. They developed their own materials, translated them into the different dialects. I mentioned the learning centers. These are the schools that they have established in the different communities. And as of 2018, they were able to establish 2010 learning centers and 
if you multiply it by 30 because the um, cap for the number of students for each class was 30. So imagine the number of students that were able to access education in the most remote, remotest, they call it remotest part of the provinces in Barm. So who acted as learning facilitators? Who are the teachers? Originally, and specifically it was mentioned that the teacher or learning facilitator must be female. I know some people will question this, but we also question them. But according to them, it is part of the design of the program. The learning facilitator must come from the community. Why? Because if the learning facilitator will come from the community, then they know the people. And so if a child misses school or if a student misses school, then they can easily check on the parents why they are not attending school. And because of the condition in different communities, there they were not enough college graduates. So they accepted the high school graduates to be the learning facilitators. But they enhanced their knowledge, their delivery through capacity building. And in this capacity building, series of trainings were conducted. The most unique to them is the monthly refresher course. At the end of the, at the end of each month, the learning facilitators gather and talked about what lessons they had difficulty in the delivery during the past month. But also at the same time, they also discussed what will be the lessons to be shared or to be taught in the following month so that if they have some difficulties, they can ask for a resource person or an expert on the topic. And in terms of management, yes, it's right that BRAC Philippines, which is uh, the NGO, the main NGO, implemented the program, but they cannot implement the program in the different provinces by themselves. So they had to have local partners and they were able to engage the partnership with 16 local non-government organizations who implemented the day-to-day -day activities of the learning centers. And most importantly, here are the parents. According to attorney Maisara, BRAC ADM is not a free education because it has preconditioned, just like the four Ps, parents have responsibilities so that the implementation of the program will be facilitated and they will be updated by the progress of the students. And so are, were they able to um, achieve their main goal of increasing access to education? and quality of education. Let's find out in the next or succeeding slides. Access to education. At the time that we were evaluating the project, there were 33,401 students in enrolled in the learning centers, but by 2018, it was nearly doubled to 65,990. Imagine the number of students who were enrolled in the alternative delivery model of education. Are they really providing the catch, the catch up program for those who are out of school? Yes, because many of the students or about 70% were beyond the ideal age for a preschool learner, about more than 70% of grade one, and also a large percentage of grade two students. So they're really catching up on those who miss the school. About completion rate, they were also good where in nearly 100% of the kindergarten learners were able to complete 
the course for that particular period. How about those who are transitioning from grade one, from preschool to grade one? All of them, they were very proud to share that 100% of their students were able to transition from preschool to grade one, which is one of their, um, that they are very proud of, that they were able to retain the students in the learning centers. When it comes to quality of education, which is the, the other goal, and I think this is also one of the issues that really um, be encountered. And um, I think last year, there was um, an issue on the result of the PISA. But again, there were other contributory factors to our uh, performance, but uh, this all only tells us about the quality of our education. Uh, this uh, particular slide will tell you that the preschool uh, learners were able to improve on their scores from the pre, the mid, and the post-test for the preschool children. So it has really improved. Also, there were improvements in achievements in mathematics. This study came from a longitudinal study done by ACTR, which shows that those students who came from the public school, from the deaf ed, and also and from the learning centers have almost the same pattern of learning. Actually, the differences between them disappear on year three. So when they started on kindergarten, on, from grade one to grade two to grade three, the differences completely disappear. So it means that they are both um, performing well. Same pattern can be achieved, a uh, same pattern can be seen on literacy. Started low, but by year three, they have achieved higher scores when you compare it with year one, that is for both deaf ed and uh, the learning centers. The other part of the study was really to compare the cohort of students. And as you can see from here, there were really improvements in um, from the baseline performance of the students and their progress in mathematics, and this is in Lanao del Sur. So from a very low start at about 45%, then by uh, the, the year, end year, you can see that it increased to about more, about around 60%. So what are the strengths and challenges? Well, both of them are using the curriculum same formative tests and monitoring of the performance of teachers and students. What are the challenges? As I mentioned earlier, when you introduce something, particular parents don't think, I don't think will accept it wholeheartedly. They will have questions. And so how does the pro, how did the program cope with it? Also at that time, they have very limited time to produce the curriculum, which is anchored on the K-12 curriculum, but they were able to do it. Also, the piece, there was also the problem with peace and order. And I think for most interventions, development interventions, how do we sustain the gains from implementing the projects? I'd like to change my presentation from here because uh, I'm sorry, this, uh, this is the wrong set of um, slides. But from here, I'd like, what I'd like to say is that, what is the main message of my presentation? The main message is that 
despite the differences in modalities, students will perform as long they stay on the system. So the main challenge is how do we maintain our students or how we retain our students? As I said earlier, in any innovation, there will always be resistance to adapt, meaning will you adapt the whole program in total without any revisions or will you adapt just like now? I'm sure that we cannot really adapt the face-to-face -face, um, model um, delivery of our classes. We have to adapt or change, but it will depend on the resources that we have or the situation of the learners and also of the community. So my recommendation here is really to have a continuous dialogue between the uh, higher education institutions, not only with CHED, but also the other institutions present in the community, the local government units, because as I will uh, discuss later, they play a, an important role and also the parents. So for my last two slides, what I will be discussing is how does this study or how our experience in the evaluation of basic education relate to the flexible learning in higher education on curriculum development? That's number one. As Dr. Amy mentioned earlier, we're not starting from zero. What we are, well, for some schools in the delivery, they have started using the different modalities. You have, and the most common is the Moodle. But, and also synchronous is not possible. Asynchronous is possible, online education, because knowing the different provinces in Muslim Mindanao, access to internet varies even within a town or within a city, the access varies. For example, in Sulu, one of my students at the UP Open University, she cannot join our chat session if I schedule it at daytime. We had to schedule it at nighttime because that's the only time that there is access to internet and she had to go up into the rooftop just to access the internet. So really had to take this into consideration in thinking about the delivery that we think could be effective and also efficient. Also in the designing of the curriculum, we now have to think what exercises, what activities can really attract the attention of the students. I, I'd like also to share with you that in my in teaching at the UP Open University, I have, have a very short course outline because there's a very long um, um, there's a very long module. And every time we'll have a chat session, the students will ask, mom, when is our ex final exam? And this is explicitly and highlighted in the course outline. So you see, the, you must be creative and really catching up the attention of these students. How about capacity building? Capacity building, for me, how does the experience of BRAC relate? It is the continuous capacity building. Despite having developed the course, um, course um, the curriculum and the learning materials, they continuously building up on the, uh, on the materials that they have developed, also in the assessment method. For example, one faculty of the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, that probably we can adapt, but again, this will depend on the situation because instead of a paper and pencil exam, she interviewed one by one the students. I think she had less than 10, so she was able to do that. So by really knowing, the situation of the students or the, 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 the learning environment, we can adapt. And so instead of giving exam through paper, she interviewed them one by one, and that is on theory. How about monitoring? For me, we monitoring is there. What is important is the feedback. How can we ensure that the nuggets of learnings we will get from uh, monitoring, the results of the monitoring will really feed into the enhancement of our uh, delivery of our courses. So this is very important. 
The other aspect that I would like to discuss is building on the resources in the uh, build, building on the resources of the community. Again, if you are working with the most remote parts of the country, you'll know how difficult it is to reach them. So, how are we go how are you for example, you don't have any other option but to develop modules that will be distributed to the students. How are we going to distribute them? Luckily, if you have LBC, uh, sorry for the uh, plug, but not all areas are being serviced by couriers. In one program of the DSWD, what you know what they did? They had a contract with the jeepney drivers. They asked for the jeepney drivers from Abra in one of the most remote municipalities to bring the report to the DSWD. So there is a contract, there is an engagement between those who are in the community and the implementers so that this will ensure that the, that the students will get the learning materials if online discussion or online instruction is not possible. Same, but I'd like to focus now on the parents. I think we really need to get the message across to the parents that children are studying from school, uh, from home. Yes, they do not go to school, but they are studying from home. They have requirements, they have activities, they have assessments that need to be done. And especially for graduate school, you, we can ask ourselves, how many reading materials we ask our students? And right now, with the blended mode, then probably we can increase it. And so one of the presidents of the SOOCs here in Southern Tagalog said, we must inform the parents, we do not add more chores to our students. Let them study and then, but they can also participate, but it, the message should be put across. And the last one that I would like to share with you is, the Australian government trusted BRAC to implement this. But for the higher education, what I would like to emphasize is to nurture and invest in social capital. How? Cultivate trust between faculty and students. And how we do it? By being reliable and fair. Dr. Amy mentioned also mentioned earlier that we cannot just put a schedule and say, okay, we'll meet on this. But we have to be available to them. And if we promise something, then we should um, go back to them and answer. And we must also maintain fairness. And that will cultivate trust between faculty and students. Because in a synchronous um, mode of education, the only way by which I can, I can think of at the moment, especially for assessment, is to download the exam and then ask the students. Could you please, this is a three hour exam and you should put a timer. The exam or assessment is open for 24 hours, but you are only allowed to work on it for three hours. So there is trust that the students will really answer the exam for three hours. So there is trust. And the last point is we always see social media as, become, as becoming uh, the students on their own, even among family members at dinner time, you see them using their mobile phone, mobile phone because they are texting, etc. But it has positive side wherein students can assist each one another, build a trust among each other that they are supporting each other, and so we can achieve more by building trust, building trust between um, a faculty and students between and among the students and also those who are engaged in providing higher education. Thank you very much for listening. It was an excellent and experiential based presentation, ma'am. And I Thank think you. the key points here are, yes, the continuous capacity building, knowing the situation of students, and of course, collaborative effort between teachers, administrators, and even the, the parents themselves. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. So now this is the time for the question and answer portion. 
we are going to entertain questions from our audience. You can ask Dr. Amy and Dr. Merlin for some questions about their presentation. Okay. So here's the first question addressed to Dr. Amy. Uh, what are some models in paradigm shift in which an institution can anchor its framework? Uh, okay. So we can actually, when you're trying to implement flexible learning, uh, you are to involve a multitude of approaches whereby it all depends on the type of learners that you have and also the capacity of your faculty. Uh, as what Dr. Paolagi stated earlier, it's a cooperative type of engagement. So, for example, you can adopt a modular approach to learning if ICT is not really that available. Uh, you can also employ blended learning, like I mentioned earlier, uh, for the natural sciences, wherein there are unavoidable outcomes that we need to measure. Like, how do we assess the ability of the student to dissect frogs, for example, or toads? Uh, that needs uh, a practical assessment. So, a blended learning type of approach is more applicable. You can also do a flipped classroom type, wherein you can instruct. Sorry. And then uh, you can opt to. Uh, get feedback from the students thereafter. So the modalities that you can actually use for flexible learning is, as the name implies, as plastic as it is. Uh, it's bendable. So only your imagination would be the limitation. All right. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, here's another question, Paul, for Dr. Amy. Uh, how do we bridge the gap in terms of this intergenerational differences among faculty? Um, it all, one would be an, uh, promoting uh, an environment of cooperation. Uh, I was lucky enough to belong to an institution wherein there's really, while we know that there's a huge intergenerational gap in our institution, I never really felt that way because our senior faculty encourage us to really pick up. They train us. Uh, they try to push us into responsibilities, even when we are not, uh, when we feel that we're not comfortable doing it, but they push us anyway, so that when we make mistakes, they are there to catch us and teach us lessons. So if you grow in that kind of environment, uh, you will become open to, to ideas. And even our senior faculty, they're like friends. Uh, even if they are generations away, uh, kumbaga, we're like kumare. We could even call ourselves Mars, but that's how open and beneficial recognizing the strengths of generational differences. Yeah, but we should emphasize that the differences are there. It's working together that matters. Wow, that's very nice insight, Puma. It's just working together. Okay, uh, here's another question. This is uh, addressed for Dr. Merlin. Uh, yes. Since alternative education is not new in Bahrain, can you suggest ways or methods? How do you with um, I think, as I mentioned in my presentation, continuous dialogue among the different stakeholders. Because if the others do not really know, there are wrong messages. And so that's the cause of misunderstanding and so mistrust creep, uh, creeps in. And so if there is a continuous dialogue, then there will be, uh, everyone will be informed, rightfully informed. Also, coming from the Center for Strategic Planning and Policy Studies, I think we really need to look at the policies of the government. In implementing the different, the, for example, this alternative delivery model, there are conflicting policies which contribute to questioning its sustainability because there are policies of DepEd which are not acceptable in the RAC learning model. And so, for example, only let passers are allowed to teach in the elementary school. But in the case of RAP, they allowed teachers who are not yet college graduates. So 
what we're trying to recommend is for the local government unit to adopt their schools because they can allocate funds so that this school will continue to operate. I think there are discussions on this, even at the start of the program, how to sustain, how they will sustain the gains. And right now, there are still schools which, are, which were adopted by the Department of Education. So uh, in this manner, this, um, the gains were sustained. Yes, thank you very much, ma'am. Okay, so here's another question for, uh, for Dr. Merlin. So what will be the most appropriate monitoring system to be used in BARM HEI? So we move now to monitoring system, ma'am. Okay, for monitoring system, I know you have your own system. We, you will not, again, start from scratch. What is important, and I have emphasized before, is the use of the results of this monitoring. Because if we keep on monitoring, but only uh, leaving the risk, I mean, um, the results are not being used. So we're wasting resources. As we always say, we monitor, but we also feed this back to the uh, faculty members and also to, to students to a certain extent. For example, the year end assessment made by the students, are these being uh, no, timely? being fed back to the faculty members. I know there was a time at, at the university where in, this was really the focus of the chancellor. And it was really painful for some faculty members because the qualitative statements by the students in the monitoring and the evaluation of the, of the faculty cost them their promotion. So it was really painful at that time because they really uh, look into the results of the student evaluation. All right. Thank you very much, Ma. Uh, here's a comment for from we got from YouTube. So there's a question maybe anyone can answer. How can we further avoid plagiarism in flexible learning? Okay. Or maybe so, we can ask yes, Dr. Amy. Okay, so plagiarism, uh, even in the classroom, happen. So kumbaga, when we're trying to think of this, anyone who wishes to cheat will always try or find ways to cheat. But that matter when uh, you don't really talk to your students and you don't really regular monitor the progress of your students. Um, uh, as a teacher or as an educator, here is where the heart lies. Yung dito lalabas ang pagiging guru ninyo, your heart as a teacher. Uh, you can always talk to your students, regardless of how many plagiarism detectors you employ. It's not really answering the problem of why the student is tempted to cheat. Because if you make your learning environment um, a trustful one, because at the start of the semester, I often uh, talk about the rules in class, how we aspire for honor and excellence, how honor well, it starts with an H, comes before excellence that is starting with an E, because that would be our priority. By cheating, they would only be cheating themselves out of improving themselves as students. So it is clear with our students that if they do this, they're not really helping themselves grow. Madali po siyang makita, kahit nga po wala tayong uh, plagiarism detector, if you regularly monitor your students, you will be able to tell their learning styles. So instead of punishing them, what I do tell them that your writing is not the same as what I used to read from you. I would like to hear more of your thoughts, not from other people's work. So I return them and give them the chance to improve. Kasi mas napapagigi nila if you talk to them like they are truly our learners, not, not individuals who are not uh, capable of doing more. And if if you convey that effectively, they do their best and they don't try it anymore. Okay, thank you, Ben. Dr. Yeah. Amy, do uh, yeah. Dr. Marine? Yeah. yeah, I do agree with what um, uh, Dr. Amy said, but uh, yes, I agree. And I think she's very right that when you really pay close attention 
to the work submitted by your students, you will immediately see if they copied someone's, someone else's work because you know their writing style. So when I encounter this, I talk to the students and ask them, can you please revise them? Can you put please the, the source of the materials? Because you will see in some of the uh, written materials, you will know that there were figure that there are figures in there, and yet they have not cited any source, and that, that's one already a, a, an indication that they copied it from some from other works. So, if you really know your student, their style of writing, and how how do they deliver their their assignments, their reflection paper, you can easily detect them. Yes, I really yeah. agree on that point. So it's like uh, in teaching, you really have to learn your student style, learning styles. Yes. All right, so another question, or maybe not a question, or comment from the comment section. Uh, here, Paul, ask uh, for suggestions. Any suggestions on how to deal with students who are frontliners? So, Dr. Merlin, uh, yeah. can you suggest uh, I have an experience. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, have a, I have an experience with that because one of my students is a nurse for residential and online. So I try to understand them both. For example, for my online uh, class, I have a doctor in my class. So I really try to understand them, message him constantly, reminding him, if you have time, could you please submit your requirements? Because even uh, we know that they are frontliners, but we also have other students. And as I mentioned before, we build trust by being fair to students. We do understand that. Maybe give them some extension in submitting the requirements, but we have also to remind them that there are also other students. But, and he, ano, and mag, ano naman siya, okay naman siya. Hindi naman siya nagre if I kept on reminding him, na, please submit your requirement before, uh, I mean, when the uh, deadline is due, but I'll, I'll give him more time. But if there are also other students who are not frontliners, who were not able, because they also have problem with internet connection, even students who are attending online classes, design as online class, they have also some difficulties. So I also give them, listen to them, and trust them that the reasons they are giving are really true. And so by that, then I, will, I, I was able to accommodate them. Wow, I think that's a very good way of really helping the student as well. Okay, Paul. So there's another question. Uh, given the shift, I think this is for Dr. Amy. Okay, a uh, question from John. Let's acknowledge the person who gave the question. John N. Ponsaran. So given the shift in mode of learning delivery, we also need to change performance assessment of faculty. So example is the set. Dr. Amy? Yes, um, of course. Uh, remember the, the chart I showed you earlier. If our mode of delivery changes, that means how we assess, how we teach will also change. So there will be a need to at least evaluate again if our assessments for teaching are now different, especially uh, that our assessments for teaching now are geared towards face-to-face uh, -face learning. So, what now for uh, the flexible learning scheme? So, mapapago po talaga siya. Yes, I hello, think there's Jan. really... Opa? Yeah, I just said... Uh, how about Dr. Say Marie? hello to Jan. No, no, it's okay. Add? I just said hello to Jan. He's one of my students before. Wow, what a small world po, ma'am. <laughs> okay. So... For questions, we can, I think, entertain two more questions. Oh, here's another question, Paul, from Rasuman Kasidar. So most of the schools, especially those who offer senior... The president of the uh, Kabiti State University were in now learning materials for laboratory classes are being piloted. And so we, we can also learn from what others are doing because they were saying about, how about in the field of medicine? How about in the field of nursing? Wherein there are um, laboratory activities or even in the chemistry. 
they were saying that now there are uh, virtual materials that are being prepared, and but uh, it was not shared uh, on what stage are they in in the development of this virtual uh, uh, laboratory uh, materials for the laboratory. Yes, and I think uh, also some agencies are doing their best also for the learning management system and some online resources that faculty can use to the students, for their students. Okay, so another question, I think this is addressed to Dr. Amy. Uh, what are the indicators that an institution is undergoing this transformative education? Dr. Amy? Yes, sorry, I, I was disconnected. Uh, can you repeat the question again? Yes, Paul. Uh, this question, uh, what are the indicators that an institution is undergoing transformative education? I think this is based on the concept of Banyu Haipo, ma'am. All right, so Dr. Amy is disconnected. So maybe any insight that we can that we can share, Dr. Merlin, uh, based on your experience in BARM. Yes. Yeah. So can you, mm -hmm. yes, Paul. Uh, what are those indicators that we can see that this school really has undergone transformative education? Well, it will be reflected on the kind of curriculum that they will offer also on the modality or the mechanism by which these are being delivered. And I think those are the indicators that uh, we need to look at because um, this is very important that the courses or the, uh, the curriculum is effectively delivered to the intended uh, students. And so those are the indicators that I would really look at. Down the line, I think the indicators that we would like to see is the achievement of the students. That yeah. have we really transformed our system? Because there is always the anxiety. I think every one of us is anxious to find out, are we really teaching the students of what we intend to teach them? Because this is the first time that we will be doing this online, I think whether synchronous or asynchronous, depending on the uh, depending on the situation of the students and as well as the uh, university, the resources that the university has. And so the, the final indicator will be the performance of the student. That's how I look at it. Wow, that's a very good answer, Paul. And I also, I would say, agree on that, that there must be change so that we can see that there's really learning in the part of the students. All right. so. There's another question. Uh, we got this from YouTube, ma'am. Uh, how does flexible learning relate to personalized learning? Can you cite some ideas, Paul? Uh, uh, personalized learning, to a certain extent, is reflected in the flexible learning because you have to take into consideration the environment of the learner. You really have to find out, you, you know, um, which is quite difficult because, for example, my class is composed of 31 students. I have asked them to answer a survey, a short survey, but only 19 of them answered my, the, our survey. And as we found out, there are so many preferences. If there are 19 students who answered the survey, there are 19 preferences. And so what we're going to do then, we have to learn or we have to know what is the most common for them. What is, for example, just a simple question of when do you want to, when do you want to uh, have the exam? Each one of them had different answers. But you see, when another student did a survey similar to us, they answer, they came up with the, a date for our exam. So you see, as I mentioned earlier, we should nurture social capital among students so they among themselves can talk. Maybe they're too shy to talk with a faculty member. So that's what I say. It's difficult because sometimes really 
personal differences can really come in into the picture. Yes, I agree on that also, ma'am, because everyone is really unique. Oh, ma'am. We have a comment, I think, from Miss Dulce, Elazige, uh, question rather. So, here's the question. Has there been any effort to explore problem-based approach as a learning mode? Uh, maybe I can give this to Dr. Amy. Any idea po, ma'am, on this problem-based approach as a learning mode? All right. Uh, yes, ma'am. Dr. Merlin? Maybe you can also share your idea first. I think some of the faculty members have already explored on that one. Even with a face-to-face -face, um, mode, some of our faculty members, I know they utilize this mode of, it's a problem-based approach. So, but I think this is not really explored by many of the faculty members, but there are. Even with the College of Public Affairs and Development, we. They have already started this one. I know of one faculty who's using that one. Can Dr. Amy hear us now? Hello, Dr. Amy. Are you in now? <laughs> Hello, Dr. Amy. Hello. Hello, Dr. Amy. Yes, but any insight, idea for on this problem-based approach? Yes, as Dr. Merlin stated that this has also been done uh, before, but not all faculty are doing this. So maybe it's really high time for us to explore these strategies. And I think there is no single best method in teaching. So as teachers, educators, it's really a must to explore and to experiment what's the best learning style or learning strategy for our students. Hello, Dr. Amy. I think we've lost connection okay. with Dr. Amy. Yeah, so anyways, uh, thank you very much for your questions and for the comments. And much as we would like to continue this webinar, but we are bound to end our lively and strategic discussions. I know for sure that you have your bring home knowledge for, from our two commendable speakers, which will be useful in the implementation of flexible learning in Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, higher education institution. Again, I would like to thank you, Dr. Amy and Dr. Merlin, for sharing your expertise to our viewers. In behalf of the Chad Pecko team, headed by our Every Dynamic Director, Dr. Nelia A. Alibin, we would like to thank you for the support for our activities. More webinars will be given, so please don't forget to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. This has been Eden. This is Eden Stephanie Bolido, your host for today, saying continual education is the key to progress. Mabuhay tayong lahat. Thank you very much. And good thank afternoon. Thank you very much, ma'am. Okay, bye.